<laughs> but lovely day and it's beautiful here with this lovely scenery all around. I'm sure people, most people will know uh, what we're about in this service, but just to refresh your memory, the National League and uh, it was, uh, sorry, the Covenanters were those who signed the National Covenant in 1838 and the National League and Covenant in 1643. They had three basic um, goals in doing so. The first one was the preservation of the Protestant faith. The government, the authorities wanted to bring in bishops and Episcopalian because they could control what was being preached and what was being said in the churches. Presbyterians, of course, fiercely independent, would have none of it. The second a major thing for them was the spiritual independence of the church. So that the government couldn't tell us what to believe, what to teach, what to say. And that still today is incredibly important. And the third thing, above them all really, is the sole headship of Christ within the church. He alone is our head. He alone is our master. And that was so important to the Covenanters. It was during the worst of times, between 1660 to 1690, so-called the killing times, when these conventicles happened, it was a dangerous thing to be a Covenanter. It was a dangerous thing to go to Covenanters' services. And so they met up in the hills, hence the need for a blanket. And it's called blanket preaching ever since. The whole thing came to an end, happy to say, in 1690. William of Orange had been appointed king and Presbyterianism was established in Scotland. And that's been part of our history ever since. But during that time, it was a very dangerous thing to be a Covenanter. And that's what we remember today. And as we're remembering it, our thoughts and our prayers surely will turn to the many people across the world who are persecuted because of their faith in Jesus Christ. In many lands, it is a dangerous thing to confess the name of Christ. And so our thoughts will turn to them as we go. But let's worship God as they have done so in so many generations ago. And using the same kind of psalms that they would have sung, we're going to begin with Psalm 100, all people that on earth do dwell. It's on the order of service. And I'm going to get my mate here to help me sing it.
Well done with the singing. Our reading is from 2 Timothy chapter 4, reading verses 1 to 8, if I can rescue it from the pocket. Yay! 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 1 to 8. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and because he has come in to rule as king, I solemnly urge you to preach the message, to insist upon proclaiming it, whether the time is right or not, to convince, reproach and encourage as you teach with all patience. The time will come when people will not listen to sound doctrine, but will follow their own desires and will collect for themselves more and more teachers who will tell them what they are itching to hear. They will turn away from listening to the truth and give their attention to legends. But you must keep control of yourself in all circumstances, enduring suffering. Do the work of a preacher of the good news and perform your whole duty as a servant of God. As for me, the hour has come for me to be sacrificed. The time is here for me to leave this life. I have done my best in the race. I've run the full distance and I have kept the faith. And now there is waiting for me the prize of victory awarded for a righteous life, the prize which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but to all those who wait with love for him to appear. May God bless this reading of his holy word. Amen. Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, as we gather here on the hillside with the beauty of all that is around us and the grandeur of the hills, we can know your presence with us very closely. We can see that grandeur and worship you as the Lord of all creation, the maker of heaven and earth, of the vastness of the universe and every tiny flower and plant. We can worship you as the giver of life. For you loved us so much that you gave us your own son, our Lord Jesus, that he should die upon the cross for our sins. And that in rising to eternal life, he's promised to all who believe in him a place in your eternal glory. It is beyond our understanding. And yet we cling to that cross of Jesus that promises us so much. We worship and praise you for all your goodness and love to us. We remember the covenanters. We remember their sacrifice, trying to keep the flame alive of true worship, of true understanding of your word, and of a clear message of hope. And we pray, Heavenly Father, for all those today who are suffering because of their faith. We think of them in lands abroad, in lands like China, in North Korea, and various other places. Places where to love you is to court death. And we pray, Lord, for all who are persecuted in this and in every land. And we pray for your strength and grace to be with them, that the message of your love will go forth, whatever the cost, whatever the season, whatever the time. All glory and majesty be yours, O Lord. Grant your blessing upon us as we gather, upon those whom we love and those who are unable to be here with us today, but whose thoughts are with us. We remember them before you. And we pray now for that blessing to continue with us as we seek to serve you and to glorify your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And let's sing once again. The psalm is number 46, God <coughs> is a refuge and a strength.
want to sing the Amen at the end of these hymns, don't you? These old psalms. Let's again join for a moment in prayer. Let us pray. And Lord, as we come to seek to understand your word to us and all that you have for us, we pray that you will open our hearts and minds to you, to your Holy Spirit, that you will guide and lead and direct us. And in all our prayers, Lord, we pray in the name and in the strength of our Lord Jesus. And we remember and we say together the words that he himself has taught to us, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> it was towards the end of that killing time when a young man visited his father in prison. He had been convicted of being a covenanter and was locked up. And the young boy must have been greatly affected by visiting him there. The young boy also went to hear his favourite preacher, the Reverend Ebenezer Erskine. And it must have been at a conventicle just like this, really, in the hills, because he too was a covenanter, and it was also dangerous for him to be preaching. The young boy was 12 when he went to hear him, and it had a huge influence on him. In turn, he became a minister himself, and he came to the borders, first of all, and then in 1707, he became the minister of Ettrick. It wasn't an easy time for Thomas Boston, but he came to be much loved and much respected and to shape the spiritual life of the parish for generations to come. The welcome board down at uh, the entrance to Ettrick says that he was much feared now, I've read a lot about Thomas Boston, and I can't find anything like that whatsoever. Much loved, yes. He was a great pastor. He wasn't a great preacher. But then there were many other great preachers around in his day, and when they died, they were soon forgotten. He wasn't a great preacher or a great speaker. Many debates he didn't take part in because he was very diffident. And yet he was a great writer. And being a pastor of a small country church, it gave him lots of time to write a lot. And in fact, he wrote 12 volumes of works, complete works. The largest collection of spiritual books in Scottish church history. Many better preachers, as I say, when they were around, when they died, they were soon forgotten. But it said even a hundred years after the time of Boston, Thomas Boston, that there wasn't a church member who didn't have one of his books on their shelves. He was a huge influence and had a tremendous ministry, especially through the written word and the books that he wrote. When he was at Simprin, before he came to, to Ettrick, he saw on the shelf of one of his parishioners a book which was called the marrow of modern divinity. Marrow being like the marrow in your bones, the very bones of modern divinity. And when he read it, this was to change his whole preaching in a marvellous way. 
to be written 50 years before his time. And it, it changed the emphasis for a more extreme Calvinism, something that Thomas Boston didn't really uh, embrace or preach, but a, a more extreme Calvinism, which insisted that the way to salvation was first of all to repent and then to believe. So all their preaching was aimed at your sins, to get you to repent. And that was the fiery preaching of the time for many people. Not everyone, of course, different degrees for different people. But that was the ethos in which he was minister. And from the scriptures, that book argued, and so did Thomas Boston, that it was once you knew Jesus as Lord, that you would come to repentance. It's when you know someone that you want to say sorry to them for all the wrong things you have done to them. That changed his preaching dramatically. He said it gave him a new freedom. He knew he was on the right lines when in 1720, he and the rest of the Marrow ministers and the rest of the Marrow books were all banned by the General Assembly. So he knew he was, must be right. And so, and so he was. <laughs> and he was, but he was accused, the thing that they had against him was, he was accused, and some of you will be thinking this, I know, but he was accused of antinomianism. Yes, I know. And that, me that meant, I had to look it up, that meant <laughs> that they thought he was saying that sin didn't matter. They thought he was saying that God's law didn't matter because he wasn't talking about sins to begin with. But he talked a lot about people's sins. It's just the, the focus was on Jesus and on Jesus' love. Come to know this Jesus. And then, by all means, repent. So he wasn't casting aside the law of God or any of these things in his preaching. It wasn't true. He preached the need for repentance, but it was a response to God's saving grace, not a prerequisite. He was much loved and studied through his books. But we have to ask, what brought hundreds out to the hills with their blankets in fear of their lives to hear the preaching, travelling great distances, enduring all weathers? What brought them here to these conventicles? What made them risk their lives to come in defiance of the authorities and for the preachers to preach? What was the burden and challenge that made Thomas Boston so very special as a visitor and as a preacher and inspire so many of his books? It was surely the glorious invitation to come and yield our lives to the King of Love, to the living Lord Jesus. Paul taught the same message and taught Timothy, his student. Preach the message. Convince, reproach and encourage. And it was that invitation that he wanted people and, and Timothy and us too to hear and to respond to. To hear the living Lord Jesus saying to our hearts, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. I will take your sins upon me. And that was the great message that they preached. There's a lovely old hymn. I don't think we sing this very much anymore, but it's a beautiful old hymn. And one of the verses says this. <coughs> Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot, to thee whose blood can cleanse each blot, O Lamb of God, I come. I come. And that's the message that Timothy was to preach, the message Thomas Boston preached in his writing, the message that brought people to hear and to come and to respond. And many, many gave their hearts and their lives to Jesus. And it's there for us now. It's there for us to respond to it and to know that love and power and grace in our hearts and in our lives. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you to hear that message from your lips, that message of love and welcome, that message that cleanses us from our sins, that message that draws us and speaks to us. 
and challenges us. And we long, O oh Lord, that all may respond to that message and come to know the living Lord Jesus in their hearts and in their lives. And we ask it for his name's sake. Amen. And now our a closing hymn, which is Let Us With a Gladsome Mind. Uh, Practice this at home, and I started off way too high, so you'll be way up there, maybe. I'll try and get it a bit lower. <laughs> <coughs> With a glance of mind, praise the Lord, for he is kind. For his mercy shall endure, ever faithful, ever sure. Let us sound his name abroad, for of God he is the God. For his mercy shall endure, ever faithful. Now may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon us and be with us this day and forevermore. Amen. Thank you so much for coming. And it looked awfully silly standing here moaning. Thank you for climbing the hill. And just for a minute I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> but it's just a cloud. So enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you again for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. <laughs>